change that code because of this exact situation. Okay, you're good. Okay, let's bring this uh, meeting to call it to order. And we need to approve the agenda from March from March 2nd, correct? Yeah, and uh, the minutes as well, so a consent agenda. And okay. one motion. Oh, one motion. Yeah. Okay. So do I have a motion for, to um, approve the consent agenda? I move to approve the consent, consent agenda. Mm -hmm. Second. Standing in for Doug, would you want me yeah. to do that? Yeah. I second that. <laughs> All in favor? All in favor? No. I'm sorry. No, no. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Great, we'll go on to the next section of this. So uh, there's two uh, forms for you to take a look at. Uh, this is having to do with uh, just progress on the legislative session. So probably uh, the biggest one is it looks like Highway 12 Phase 7 got out of the purgatory. So uh, it's actually in the House and the Senate budget. So unless uh, Governor Inslee does something crazy, I think it should hopefully be safe, I think. so. Because typically if it shows up in both budget proposals, it's all good. So, uh, so that's where we're at on that one. Um, as far as bills that are still alive, I include a staff's report that our lobbyist gives just on general uh, city stuff. And if you click on the hyperlink, you can learn more about each bill. Uh, ba basically, uh, I'll, quite a few of them ended up uh, dying, though uh, one having to do with community redevelopment financing, which is 4212, which is uh, tax increment financing. They called it some difference, so it didn't freak out people, but it's uh, tax increment financing. Uh, believe it or not, it's still alive, and that's that bill that would basically help with economic development, because it would basically front end load uh, infrastructure cost, uh, and then uh, pretty much as the state gets extra sales taxes instead of keeping all of it, they would share it with the city. Uh, and pretty much for the last like 15 years, it's always died and it's still alive. So, uh, so we do uh, stand a chance uh, for that going. Uh, one thing from a business standpoint, just to be um, aware of, aware of though. Um, is that multifamily housing tax exemption, which would have basically allowed all cities to participate in that. That unfortunately died again, so hopefully it'll pass one of these days, but uh, that leads to a fairness issue, because right now, uh, if you're a county seat, if you're in a county above a population of 100,000 or you're in the largest city in a county, you can do it. Uh, so right now it means Walla Walla can do it, but we can't. Um, so that is still hang, hanging out there again. Uh, hopefully uh, we will be uh, able to uh, eventually get to that point. Uh, and you can see a, a lot of other just uh, random uh, bills that are moving their way forward, though. Uh, there's a tourism authority one, uh, and that one uh, we've been opposing because they actually want to divert money away from tourism authorities again, uh, and that's still alive, so we're watching that. That's uh, 6592 on page 2. Uh, there's a couple of other bills, including Senate Bill 5970, which would uh, look at additional ways for funding infrastructure since Initiative 976 passed. That, so the, uh, the alternative measure, that one is uh, still alive. So, it, so in general, um, the main thing we are concerned about, which is the tax increment financing one, uh, that still looks like it has a chance of passing because both bills uh, that are connected to it, uh, which basically is HJR 4212 on page one, and then uh, SHB 1938, they're both still alive, so that's good. But a lot of the 
a lot of uh, other stuff has died already, so it looks like they're just trying to get out of there, and then it's all going to be on the table for the longer session. Uh, so, any, uh, any uh, questions on any of this? The one thing to be aware of just as business owners is there uh, still is a bill that's alive over there having to do with uh, basically banging plastic bags and that's like still floating around doing it on a statewide level so uh, be aware of that. Okay, next go to the retail recruitment one and then click on the slide. Okay, uh, do you have the clicker? Okay, thank you. to go over some of what we'll be doing at that International Council of Shopping Center show and to give you a little flavor of what we'll be looking for. So this was a PowerPoint and slideshow uh, webinar that I sat in on a couple weeks ago. It looked pretty interesting. So I'll just go over this really uh, quickly so you could see what's going on. And if you have any questions, let me know. So with this, uh, as you can see here, holiday sales increased and home center and electronics and e-commerce are doing good, but uh, department stores continue to lag, continue. Uh, the big thing is the uh, e-commerce, but uh, actually the thing that you'll see as it gets into the uh, stats where I think College Place has a good run for additional businesses is it's once more for experiential uh, retail and then restaurants, uh, hotels, and uh, things of that sort, and even businesses where they have a presence online, but then they want to go bricks and mortar. We're starting to see it pivot the other way. Uh, next. So the, the thing that we have to watch is that uh, Amazon is still has like a 47% sharing everything and just to share with this committee because I get a lot of questions about well uh, why don't we have like a Target yet or why haven't you gotten a Kohl's yet. One of the things that uh, every time we go to Las Vegas and we've been in a holding pattern on that is Amazon's actually looking at buying both of those, Target and Kohl's. So, so that's why they haven't uh, been building more stores yet because they're waiting to see how that all sorts out. So, so that's actually the background information on that because I always get a lot of comments from residents like why don't we have that yet and that's why because they're uh, waiting for the dust to settle on that they'll be allowed to merge like that. Because right now Amazon owns Whole Foods right now too. They own them. That's good to know. Yeah. Nice. I just share that because I get that question a lot. I get it from the bakery too people ask me. Yeah, like a ton. <laughs> Uh, so as you can see, I mean, this feeds in a whole Amazon thing. This is where all the sales are going from an e-commerce standpoint. Is a percentage of retail sales uh, in-store and then e-commerce. Everything keeps growing. The gray is in-store, so it still shows even though e-commerce is important, uh, that the bricks and mortar is still uh, trending on its own. Next. And then the interesting thing where like uh, that development's looking at going underway behind Home Depot where I think we have a play in this is there's a lot of retailers like Bonobos and Orby Parker and once where if you go to University Village over by University of Washington, uh, 
in Seattle, once it used to be just online, there it's actually going the reverse now, where they're trying to actually get store presences and communities. So uh, that's really what we're going to be pushing for when we go to Vegas, because there's actually quite a bit of money sitting on the sidelines that way. Mm -hmm. So not really the traditional brick and mortar ones anymore, but the ones that have gone online that are now looking to do uh, showroom type stuff. Uh, next. And then, as you, and then as you can see here, the big influences is basically all businesses that are on social media. Next. Uh, and then, and then uh, millennials and especially discount sector. Uh, coupons are still can here. Ninety four percent use coupons and fifty four percent make uh, purchases online. But they go basically to the showrooms to look at the products first. So next, and then the Generation Z. Uh, this is interesting where they actually bounces off. Uh, from the millennials, they actually prefer to shop uh, in store and test new products there. So that's why you're seeing the pivot point away from, uh, in essence, uh, just the online element. Uh, so that's why a lot of the online retailers are now going back the original way of bricks and mortar. Uh, next. Uh, interesting thing I share with us is that even with all the store closings you hear about, uh, the actual aggregate retail number continues to increase, uh, and it keeps doing that year to year. Uh, the things that are going away that we need to get away from is folks talking about basically trying to get Macy's back or Dillard's or your classical department store type stuff. Uh, that's not probably going to ever come back, so we need to like get past that. Uh, the ones that are growing, it tends to be uh, the fast food, the restaurants, experiential stuff, uh, and then also uh, the grocers and the uh, stuff like that. So like Fred Meyer, for instance, uh, uh, we definitely have the play for that in Winco. Um, and then the other thing too, because I hear about the uh, where there's a need for it, but it's a li even though we ha we actually uh, have a ton of leakage in the sector, it's looking like we can't really attract more on the apparel side because a ton of those are closing uh, now too. So it's mainly restaurants, experiential stuff, and then grocers and hotels and things like that. Okay, next. And then this just shows you uh, the things that are growing and uh, what's dying. So as you could see, department stores here are actually going ne around negative now because one is around equilibrium. Uh, so drug stores like uh, Rite Aid and CVS are going good, especially hard goods, bars and restaurants, fast food, the food supermarket, and then convenience stores and the super stores are really growing. So that's where we'll be targeting things. Next. Uh, fast food and the bar and restaurants, as you can see here, when you look at closing stores versus gaining stores, uh, both of them are growing way more than uh, stores are actually losing. So that, that's where a lot of the money is at. Next. Uh, the target, the interesting thing, and this goes into what I was saying, is when the whole Amazon dust cloud settles, what they are starting to do in the meantime is open up smaller ones around universities. So whenever that all gets sorted out, I think the target that may fit our community and areas like this aren't going to be the traditional ones you see where they're giant or the super targets. It's going to be more like neighborhood-based ones. So I th uh, actually where I went to school at, they opened one of those about a year ago. Uh, it's a smaller one, but it carries a pretty decent array of items. So it'll be like a scaled down version of Target. Pretty similar, actually, if you go to some of the more recent Whole Foods that have opened up on the I-5 corridor. Next. Um, and then also ones that essentially have workshops or things like that. So again, going to the experiential retail. Next. 
Um, and, and again, things things where there's events like in-store sleepovers or th anything that has like an event attached to it seems to be what's growing right now. Next. As you can see here, uh, the stores that are grow growing are all ones that have other ancillary things in addition to what they're selling. Uh, so basically ones that look different have workshops, have food offerings, on-site music and events, areas for uh, social connecting, things like that. So those are stores that are growing. Okay, next. Uh, and then outdoor lifestyle ones, those are growing as well. Uh, this is important to note because that development that, that uh, keeps looking at the site behind Home Depot, that's basically what that would end up being like a lifestyle center, like uh, faux downtown type development. So that's what's like in nowadays. It isn't really the strip mall thing anymore. Uh, next. Okay, next. And again, it's making sure we have the right side in the right market. We're in this like weird territory right now where uh, the areas that the retailers tend to look at fall into a couple markets like the A, B, and C. So right now we're basically like in a C market. Uh, so C market are basically uh, counties or areas when a 20 minute drive time they have about 70,000 people and we just hit that this last year or so. Uh, before this year, it was actually, uh, since they recalibrated what their model was, it's was really hard to talk to uh, people nationally at all because if you only hit that 70,000 number, they don't really want to hear from you. Whereas 10 years ago, they actually did. But ever since the recession, uh, a lot of the companies that used to go on markets below 70,000, so a D market, they've either gone up to a C market or a B market like the Tri Cities. And Tri Cities markets like 250,000 people in a 20 minute drive time. So, like when people wonder, like, why we don't have like a party city, for example, that's why they actually shifted uh, their requirements for 10 years ago. Like when they started to buy the site over by Valley Mall and Union Gap, they were within that 70,000 number. And since that time, they shifted up to 250,000. So it's something to be cognizant of. Uh, so that's why we have Party City. But the nice thing is, though, is that we shifted from that D market to a C market. So that opens us up to a lot of different uh, companies that really wouldn't take us seriously before. So it's good that we're up at the 70,000 uh, number now. Next. So, and uh, you've all seen this in the past, except Charlie, because it's been past meetings, but that's why we have all of our flyers and our business websites. So we have all of our sites up on the state uh, uh, real estate inventory. Uh, we go to the ICSC show, and then we have all the data and all the uh, corridor-specific flyers that are actually out in the foyer, and we use them and attract uh, folks. Next. And again, you can see how the trade area is. It isn't really like a box or city limits. It's legitimately the drive time. So our area, it pretty much just expands uh, pretty much along Highway 125 and then Highway 12 going in the various directions. Next. Uh, and then how they get the information, and we subscribe as we business analysts, and they actually keep all the data. They don't tie it to a specific person, but the data we get from Esri Business Analyst is actually aggregated by zip code, or they actually get everyone's expenditure habits who use credit and debit card by zip code, so you can see where people are traveling to mm -hmm. and everything else. So that's how we get the most accurate data. Uh, and then it understands where people are coming from and where they're going to. And while our, leak, our leakage has definitely improved, uh, since the town center development still is up there, mainly on the grocer side uh, and then the wholesale side, such as Costco and then also uh, restaurants, even with downtown Walla Walla, uh, we're still at about like a 50% leakage of Tri-Cities. 
Um, and again, uh, this is essentially just how how uh, we do all this data, just aggregating it via opportunity analysis. Next. And then uh, we've done this gap analysis just to show uh, with what our needs are, and a lot of it is restaurants, um, mainly dining restaurants, uh, and, th and things like that, experiential retail, and then the grocers. Next. And then the key thing we do, and this is the uh, last slide that's a appropriate for this meeting is it's, uh, and we do is really good here is we have know all the available sites so we have the site information uh, for all of them as well as all the utilities uh, that serve them uh, and we've actually been repurposing quite a few of the sites which is uh, good but our our real issue is uh, with some, with some of the sites, we don't have like a ton of them, so it's, it's making sure we have the right fit for everything. And then also working with our partner utility districts, because uh, one thing that we have to overcome too, which is a complication a lot of other areas don't have, is College Place serves the utilities the 75% of the city limits, but there's actually 25% that ser uh, where potable water is served by uh, irrigation districts uh, that don't have of, like fire supply. So we've been trying to work with them on that, having interlocals uh, agreements where we can help on the fire supply perspective. But that's why the area in College Place North of C Street can be a challenge at times, because that actually isn't in our water service area. It's, uh, it's covered by what's called the Green Tank Irrigation District. And uh, we're actually doing a study with them on a potential consolidation where they would join with the city water system. Uh, but that, yeah, that's just a, some of our little unique quirks here. Uh, so that just gives you a taste on where things are going. So basically, I just showed that to demonstrate that the classical department type store, uh, stuff is dead, but there uh, is a market where it's actually going the other way now, where a lot of folks who have money want to spend, they actually want to see the products first. So uh, we have very healthy market for local stores, restaurants, uh, and experiential stuff and things where it's uh, basically like a Fox downtown development. It has like live and work spaces. So that's really what we're going to be uh, working towards. So any questions on that? When is the conference? Uh, uh, that'll be May 17th through 19th okay. in Vegas. And are there any specific targets that you have for recruitment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean the 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 big one which uh, we've been working with them, uh, but we continue to make sure that we work on a cement deal is really the 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 Fred Myers the Winkos because we are big enough now to attract their interest. Uh, once we once we figure out the deal is done or not. Uh, Coles and Target, they are interested in here. It's just this whole Amazon thing that's muddying it up. Uh, so it's, th it's really things like that. And then uh, getting more of the restaurant establishments too. Uh, the big thing that really has been hindering us is quite a few of the restaurants have been changing like owners, the corporate ones. So basically Darden, who own like Red Lobster and Olive Garden, those have split now where Red Lobster is like its own thing and then they end up buying more uh, too. So basically it's having to restart that whole conversation because a bunch of people that used to represent them have now been fired. So uh, that whole institutional memory is lost. But on the flip side, uh, the folks I talked to before, we weren't really much of interest because we were below the 70,000s, uh, and now we're above that. Uh, and then also, it's really trying to get the hotel deals matured, too, because there's a ton of that on the sidelines. A lot of it uh, hasn't been for lack of interest. It's really been trying to get the property owners, frankly, to realize that you are in Metro Seattle, so yeah, we have a tight urban growth area, but 
you can't really hold your land over them uh, and demand like 12 million. That's not going to happen. Uh, and that's been an issue too because we've had quite a few deals in college place proper where uh, the deals have almost been to the point of happening and they would blow up. Uh, because at the last minute the property owner would change the goalpost and they'd be like, well, uh, we'll just move our money in another area with someone that's more willing and then it would fall apart. So uh, that site where Goodwill is going now, that's a prime case in point uh, because that is in the guy who owned, who owned that was an investor from outside the area and since I've been here before Goodwill Gillen, there were probably about 16 deals that blew up on that one site. Easily. Uh, in fact, a lot of what's at the town center right now, uh, in, uh, either pairs of one or two were supposed to be over there, but then right when they get close to him, the deal finalized, the goalposts would change, and then it just made things in a disarray. Yeah, it's weird. <laughs> so, any further questions? Or? Okay, then we'll go to the next one. And this is a concept where I just wanted the opinion of this body on uh, this. There is a, there's basically a grant program that the uh, State Community Economic Revitalization Board has where it's a, a committed partner program and they will be, it's competitive, but if they decide to grant you the grant, they'll pay for up to 50% of constructing a building. And the issue that we've had in college places, there's actually quite a few flux tenants and uh, light industrial tenants that would like to come in our city, but, but they want the stuff already built and we have no space. In fact, that building at Whitman and Evans actually has a waiting list, the uh, old Blaze King building, uh, where they make like wine barrels and so, f and there's a bunch of other businesses too. Uh, that one actually has a waiting list to it, and there's like no other buildings that are just ready to go. So one of the things that the mayor and I've been looking into, and we've talked with the port about it, is potentially maybe going after one of these grants and maybe seeing if it's something with a partnership where we do a city-owned building and then lease it and actually do like a spec, a speculative flux space like out at Mar either Martin Airfield because uh, Corliss seems to have an interest on the far uh, west end of his property past the airport or the Googly and Melly site on Rose Street because that field over by Damson because uh, uh, that one actually has utilities going to it already so that would be a lot more straightforward. But before we even invest the time in going after a grant, we're going to have the same conversation with the uh, city council, but we just want to get feedback on that about whether or not to potentially go after the grant to be doing that. Well, I would say it's a good. It's worth exploring for sure. Yeah. You know, because if people don't have the possibility, then there's no way for them to even explore an idea that they might have of trying to get a business off the ground, or. You know, it, it, if there's no opportunity, it just kind of stymies the creativity that people have. So if they knew that there was an option, uh, a way that they might be able to dip their toe into the manufacturing industrial, light industrial area, it, it would be good to have. It, it is kind of a chicken and an egg situation where if you don't have a facility, you don't have the people. but. What good is it to have a facility if, if nobody wants it? Uh, but it's definitely worth exploring. Okay. I agree. Because that, that, that traditionally isn't really something that like cities do typically. It's dependent upon the private sector. The problem is we have a lot of folks that like have barren land where it's like, well, go buy my land. But the folks that want to actually do the business, they want the stuff already built. And if you go to other areas, like for instance, uh, like Pasco, that port out there actually has 
already built space, so they just end up going over there. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've had that in several cases of folks interested in doing business over here because there wasn't something already built for them to renovate and then lease. They're like, okay, bye, and then they went to Pasco, and that's what and that's what's been happening. Because there's actually quite a few folks with the airport, the Martin Airfield over here, and the rail line here, and with 125 and Myra here, they're very interested in this side of the metro area it's just we have uh, very little industrial space um, and in talking with the port they're in general they're supportive of this but uh, they don't really want to take the bull by the horns really with College Place. They're a lot, they seem to be a lot more driven by the Burbank area uh, than over here but because we're the city, we would like to see some of that come over here naturally. So, yeah. and being able to diversify your economy is always a good idea. Yeah, if we don't have a whole lot of industrial and college place. It would be nice to have options in that area. Okay. Thoughts, Charles? All right. The thought of the the port being obviously they've paved the way from that area themselves. Yeah. Do you think they would be a, a good partner to have? Maybe there's a way of enticing them to, to be more, a little more active in, in this area rather than others. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, we we've, we've been trying to on that. They just see there there seems to be a pretty significant uh, preoccupation with the whole Burbank area, but we can't let our area falter because of that. So. Uh, Pretty much the discussions with them is if we got the ball rolling and get, got some grant money from another source, they would likely come to the table at that juncture, uh, but not really prior to that. So that's why we're, we're going to likely start uh, barking down that tree. So. Sounds like a good idea. Okay. Sounds very positive. Okay. Good. Okay. Uh, if we could go to development update. Okay, uh, anything else? Good. I do this every month. This is us going over where everything is at. Uh, projects where we can say who they are, uh, we will. The ones that are abbreviations, if you connect, you can connect the dots just seeing what the abbreviations are uh, pretty much. And then, uh, we have staff sheet just saying where everything is going. So Project CK, which is a gas station, we're pretty close to that landing uh, at the corner of 12th and Myra, which is good. Because we're really trying to get a gas station on this side of the valley that uh, would be open longer hours. Because we hear it, that is a common complaint. The, the gas stations we do have aren't really open super long, and they're also closed on Sabbath, and people run out of gas here. So. Uh, next, yeah. uh, Project HM. Uh, this is actually a brand new one. So this was this is again looking at that site where Dutch Brothers was thinking of going, the former uh, car wash at Ninth and College. There is now another uh, coffee thing similar to Dutch Brothers, although like local, but they just want it like drive through solely with a deck. Uh, so they're looking at going there now. Yeah, and, they, and that's a brand new one. So it's not a chain, it's a local no, one? No, it's, it's, a lo it's a local one, but one that already exists in Walla Walla, and they want to do a secondary one, because right now the one that exists is only walk-in, and this one they want mainly have businesses like a drive-through. So. Again, look at the abbreviation and you can make the connection there. <laughs> so, uh, Project Dollar, uh, this is another bank. Uh, they are looking at going to College Avenue Corridor. Uh, another bank, which was called Project Idaho, but now we can say who they are because the signs are up. Uh, that's a credit union out of Potlatch, Idaho, called P1FCU. And uh, when I was the city manager in Colfax, 
they basically aggressively came in and took down like Umpqua Bank and all the banks in like Whitman County and went in all the small communities and they pretty much infiltrated Whitman County so from what I've seen it looks like they're trying to do the same thing here uh, so they uh, pretty much are close to having the branch open inside the Walmart that's completely renovated. Uh, that one's going to open next month. And then they're actually opening another branch already right across the street from College Place, uh, pretty much right up the hill from Petco. So right at 12th and Myra Road, the empty field on the wall, wall side, they're going to do a full branch there and they'll be open this summer. So. Uh, it's interesting though because uh, they're already talking to us for uh, locations for more branches and we're only two square miles so it's like how many do you need so uh, they seem to be in a hyper growth mode right now okay next uh, project HD uh, the cool thing with our project with Hop Thief is that's got that has gotten us on the map now for additional sit-down restaurants and like uh, bar and grill type stuff uh, because they're doing really good right now so there is a chain establishment out of the Tri-Cities and they're also in Yakima and they're looking at getting a site right across Sydney Lane from a Hop Thief now so it would be another restaurant so we're getting pretty close on that uh, next Okay, uh, Project SC, that's a, a, hair a chain uh, hair care establishment. They're looking at going inside Meadowbrook Plaza. Uh, project MD, uh, I'm basically trying to save that project because that one was a victim to the whole UGA debacle we had with the county. So they want to establish here, but they wanted the site over there. So uh, because that's the driving pattern for folks from Milton Freewater driving into the valley. So that has caused issues now. Uh, next, uh, Project Country is one of the uh, hotels. They are looking at going right over by Hoppy. Uh, so we continue working with them. Corporate's interested. They have someone who has most of the investment ready to go. They're just looking for about two or three more investors, and then they'll be ready to get going. And that would be about a 60-room hotel down there. Uh, Project, uh, Project FM, again, connect the dots. We'll be having a meeting with them at ICSC. Uh, and th their big hang up is that sewer we need to build down at the high school uh, because they want the site that Mike McKiernan owns across the street from it. But they want to make sure we aren't going to pull a fast one with infrastructure. So they'll commit on that as long as we achieve some timeline. So we've been doing that. So uh, it's really a chicken and egg game, but we're still in very good to get that to happen. Uh, and the plan is, as long as we have the wastewater line going by next summer, then they'll make the commitment on the land and then start going on it. So, okay, next. Uh, human being, I'm expecting that to open up in the next couple weeks. That's that little coffee shop right behind uh, Home Depot. Uh, and that's actually going to be out. Their hours are interesting because they're going to be open a lot later, too. Uh, and talking about the city, they'll probably be open until like around 11 p.m. or midnight. So, yeah. Uh, next. Uh, Project BK and uh, th this this one uh, is uh, I can say it's a Burger King. Uh, they were gonna go over behind uh, pretty much where Hop Thief is at, and it turned out that Travis Watts just bought the Hapo property over by uh, the Honda dealership, that empty corner piece and they like that one better, so it may be going over the, it's going to one of the sites because he owns both, but uh, it's starting to look like the commercial drive one they like because of stoplights right there. Uh, the library district, uh, that's, gonna, that's exciting for us. That's actually gonna open at the beginning of May, and the library will be open seven days a week, so we'll actually have a full-fledged uh, library here.
Uh, Project GE6 is a motel. They continue doing due diligence pretty much at, uh, near the site where uh, Project FM is going on College Avenue. Next. Uh, Pro Project W, uh, that one it looks like it's probably going to go, that one's going to be a little weird because that one is probably going to go right by, if the Burger King ends up going there, pretty much they're selling the same stuff and it's probably going to go right behind <laughs> the Burger King on the, the empty site right behind Honda. So you'll have two very similar businesses right next to each other, but more power to them. <laughs> Do they know this? Yeah, yeah. I told them that. Uh, Project CJ, they're looking at Meadowbrook. Uh, next one. Uh, Project D, this one uh, we're still on a holding pattern on, so that's a sit-down uh, greasy spoon chain establishment. They want to go uh, at the property right next to Community Bank. The big issue is they want the left turn from Myra Road into um, commercial drive and that we have an agreement with Walla Walla for that to happen once they start touching uh, the intersection at Myra and 125 because Walla Walla wants to change and Wazda want to change uh, Myra and 125 into a roundabout so that would be part of that which we don't really care either way but we want our left turn lane and once we get that then we'll get the restaurant so uh, Project Flight, uh, Martin Airfield, uh, all of this has to do with Mr. Corliss and pretty much he's looking at doing a potential uh, light industrial thing with a company he sits on out at the West End, so we're working with him on that. It'd be a relocation from the Columbia River Gorge in Oregon, uh, basically having to do with aerospace and flight stuff, so on the West End of the airfield. So we continue to work with them on that. Uh, Project GW, which is Goodwill, uh, that's going really good. So we've had the preliminary meetings with them. Uh, site plans are going, and, pre and pretty much what's going with that is they basically want to be open by this time next year and out of the downtown Walla Walla. And they'll have an employment connection center. Uh, we're working with them where they're going to see what they can do about accommodating like a Valley Transit bus stop on their facility too. So it's going to be a really nice development. Uh, and then Project Food Cart, we continue to work on that. That's the Bell Family property at Ethan College, uh, the empty field, Kitty Corner. Uh, they're looking at basically doing uh, a test uh, food cart pod over there because we changed our code now. So we allow food trucks and food cart pods similar to the city of Portland, except less restrictive. So uh, that's going. Uh, now we get to the residential side. Homestead subdivision. Uh, they're working on some of the final phases up there. Uh, we had them sign a MOU though uh, to size the detention basin properly first because uh, we've been dealing with them about this big stormwater detention basin area that's had some water capacity issues and it still hasn't been done yet even after all these MOUs so uh, with the last phase we basically told them get the thing done first then we'll let you do the other phase so that's what's happening on that. Uh, villages of Fort Walla Walla, that's the residential component of the field behind Home Depot. Uh, I'm being told that's going to start next month. So, because uh, they were just getting some other projects off their plate. Next. Uh, Stepper Edition, this is uh, near C Street on Della. Uh, the cul-de-sacs built and there's going to be apartment, it's basically apartments back there being built. So uh, that's all good. We're getting ready to release bond on that. So that's a good project. Next one. Uh, country Estates, uh, that's over on Scenic View Drive. Uh, they're getting ready to go on that this summer. So that was the former poor farmhouse. That got demolished and they want to put some additional double wide trailers over there. So that will likely be happening uh, this summer. Next. 
uh, sermon development. That's the spring. That is the uh, U-shaped house on Spitzenberg, right across the street from Wenzel Nursery. Uh, basically, that U-shaped house will be demolished for a bunch of apartments over there. Uh, so that will be happening. Next. Uh, Miri Development, we continue to work with him. Uh, he owns some property at the end of 12th Street. Uh, basically a series of long and short plats. Uh, and we're working with him to make that happen. It'll be a, a, a couple of single family homes. Uh, next. Uh, Stone Creek Development. Uh, this one is pretty much that 260 acres across from the high school. Uh, Southwest Sewer, we are getting the plans done on that by June, uh, and then we're going to go construction on that. And, the, and to try to uh, get the properties to go quicker, uh, property owners are going to short play out their properties into basically 10 to 15 acre chunks so they could start parceling it off to respective developers. Because the folks we've been talking to, they want to develop over there, but they don't want to buy the entire 200 acres. There's several people who want to buy, like, 10 to 15 and then do it. So uh, we're working with them a parcel of up. Uh, Hamby, that is the apartment development up on the hill on College Avenue. Those apartments are under construction right now and will be ready by summer. Uh, Whispering Creek, we're working with the engineer on final review. That's that uh, space on 8th Street toward Lions Park. That was just a field. Uh, that's going to be roughly about 11 homes on a cul-de-sac. Uh, so we're working with them on some final engineering issues, but they'll be going on all this summer as well and into the next year. And, then, and that's what's going on with that. Any questions? Busy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, uh, if you could click the Mac up one. The second. Yeah. Okay, so this one is an action item because we're going to be pursuing a grant, and we and basically what I need you to vote on tonight, uh, so you call sign it, is uh, I need a letter of support for these grants we're going after, and we'll be asking a bunch of businesses and pretty much anyone and everyone for a letter of support because uh, we went after this grant opportunity about two years ago, and it's very competitive across the state, and the reason we didn't get it is they want to see significant demonstrated, uh, basically, community support. And we had that in a lot of our verbiage and some support letters, but uh, when you have like 20 support letters from here versus, let's say, uh, if there's like 50 of them from Kennewick or something, they were trying to weight it almost like that. So even though our project ranked pretty high, it, it didn't cross the line. So since that time, we've actually put away quite a bit more city funds. So we think we have a good chance of getting it. So before I ask you for a vote, I'll explain to you what basically you're voting on with the letter of support. Uh, and there's several slides here, so you'll be able to see this. this. This is Lions Park, where we have movies at the Park and Farmers Market. They have majority of the infrastructure out there dates from when it was built in the 70s. So pretty much what we want to do is, uh, since the time we conceived this, we've actually banked a lot of our REIT money for a city match on it. So over the last several years, we have put away 400000 toward this project. The overall project, if we were to do everything, would be about $2 million. Uh, so that's why, we, naturally, we need all the grants for this. Uh, what we would want to do uh, is even though the pool exists in Walla Walla, we actually did a survey of the community and there's a number of folks that still want something aquatic in college place, uh, but we know we don't have the money or the technical expertise and is somewhat ran a pool in Colfax, I don't want to run a pool too, so uh, that's not happening. But one of the things we can do though is a splash pad, so we really want to do a splash pad and put it in the park. 
Uh, we also want to put a walking, uh, hiking path that goes around the perimeter with exercise equipment along it. And then also rehab the uh, softball field because that's in significant disrepair uh, at the moment. Uh, replace the playground equipment uh, with nature play equipment. You'll see mock-ups of that later. A new restroom, picnic shelter. Uh, and then also the picnic shelter that exists, while we would remove the roof and allow what's in it because it's in disrepair, the uh, chimney part we would actually keep and use that as a rock climbing wall over there. Uh, and then the other big thing, because we're at threat of losing uh, the ability of it to be stocked with fish, is we need to separate the pond from the creek. So right now, Garrison Creek just runs into Lions Park Pond, and there is like a weir that's connected to it, but it really should be separated because stormwater also comes into it from the subdivision above. And because right now, since there isn't a separation, uh, that pond is silting in a ton. Like every time we try to maintain it or make it deeper, uh, it automatically fills back in with sediment. So we've had engineering studies done and it needs to be separated from the uh, creek with a control structure um, and also it needs proper stormwater treatment since we're being made to do that by the state now uh, but it, it comes with a pretty hefty price tag of the two million total project that creek alone, the uh, pond alone to get that in working order is about 550,000 of that uh, the other thing would be to, uh, as part of that pathway around the park, uh, basically take out that sidewalk that goes around the perimeter and create more naturalized banks because that right now that's a significant liability of the city because the sidewalk is actually slowly falling into the sub pond and uh, it, it creates issues because a lot of little kids go over there and it's slippery and uh, we want to fix that. So uh, pretty significant project here. So if you can go next on the slides because I'm talking about, but you'll see some, this is what we want to turn the pond into. Uh, and there's three state grants out that we need to try to get done in the next two months. Uh, but this one we go after what's called Land Water Conservation Fund Grant uh, that basically requires about 50% match. But we would naturalize the banks of the pond, uh, basically put a diversion structure, separate it from the creek, and then also put a boat dock in here, a uh, fishing dock, so that way uh, when we have the youth fishing derby, it's actually a formalized uh, fishing dock. So that's the concept for the pond part. Next. This is what would uh, replace essentially a playground equipment, so it's like theme nature uh, play equipment. So as you can see here, pick the picnic shelter, it would be a log structure. This is the uh, repurposed chimney climbing wall, a nest ceiling area, a crossing bridge. There's actually a chime wall and a beaver dam log structure. So this we would go after uh, what's called a Washington Park and Recreation Grant, which requires a 25% local match. Next. Uh, the, and this just gives you a, a better delineation of what this equipment actually would look like. So this is the nest area, better swings that are uh, actually actually meet the ADA code, which right now ours does not, which is a major issue. Uh, and then a chime wall right here. Next. The beaver dam play structure, an embankment slide. Uh, we've also been uh, having a discussion about removing some of the brush on the hillside and turning some of that like into a slothen hill in the winter, so fixing that up. Next. And then this is a delineation of what the splash pad would look like. Basically where kids or uh, parents would uh, have to press a button and make it work, it wouldn't like run all the time. Uh, the thing is though, it wouldn't be recycling water, it would just be using water, because if we recycled water, uh, per state law, we would actually have to hire a full-time pool maintenance person on staff to run it. 
uh, which that's not happening with our finances. So uh, with the splash pad, as long as we keep it hooked in a water system where it, where it isn't recycling the water, our chlorination treatment works just fine and then we don't have to be having specialized people on our staff 24-7 with it. Next. And then, yeah, this is just a, the delineation showing where things go on there. Uh, but yeah, it, overall, it's a good project. Uh, this year is the heavy lifting year uh, because we really want to go to construction on all of this next summer. Um, I know in the past I've given presentations of Rotary Exchange Club. Uh, Rotary Board uh, and then Exchange Club and a lot of other folks, but we're going to be going around seeking assistance from everyone because uh, as most folks know, in College Place, we don't have that many parks to begin with. So, I mean, I put it in perspective as I tell folks where uh, I was previously city manager at in Colfax. Colfax has a third of our population, so about 2,846. Yet they have 11 parks and 300 acres of parks and the golf course and the pool. And then here we ha we have about 10,000 people here. Uh, yet we yet we only opened our fourth park only last year. And even with the addition of the fourth park, uh, citywide we only own 16.7 acres of parks. That's a like that isn't that many park, uh, and Lions Park's the biggest one. That's seven. So out of the 16.7 acres, that's seven of it right there. So uh, for the limited parks we do have, we need to make them count. So uh, we rehabbed the uh, Kiwanis Park a couple of years ago with the pickleball courts and things, and this is the next one that really needs it. Uh, and we would replace, we would also replace the restrooms too because that's a common complaint that we get in Lions Park. That that has some really rough public restrooms in there uh, and we would essentially uh, get an identical unit to what we have at Kiwanis Park. So. Sounds good. Yeah. So what's before you today is I'm start. Uh, we have to all these applications in by May, but pretty much uh, with this grant, we have to turn a whole application. Then we have to go over Olympia and then do a whole formal presentation before a board, then they rank them, and we find out where it goes. But uh, we'll be turning a series of about three grant applications, and we pretty much need a bunch of others of support. So individually, businesses, and anyone and everyone's going to be getting boilerplate letters to send back to me. But uh, as a start, I want uh, this commission to uh, take a position on this. So uh, in the agenda packet, that there was a boilerplate uh, letter of support uh, and pretty much uh, if you would vote on this uh, I would uh, I would like the Commission to essentially vote to issue a letter of support and then you all sign it and it could be incorporated in the record with the three grants uh, that go to Olympia this spring Okay. so do we have a motion to accept that and uh, sign that letter Yes, I move that we accept the letter and assign our support to it. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't feel comfortable speaking on Doug's position on this particular situation, so okay. I'll have you to could. stay. Second? Yeah. Okay. Yep. I second it. Yep. Okay. Okay, then all, call the vote. All, all all in favor. All in favor. Thank you. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Okay. Okay. Charlie, you abstain. Yes. Okay. But is that a, is it a passing? Is there yeah. an important pass? Yeah. Okay. So you will get that letter to us? I have that. I need you. So we can sign yeah. it tonight? Yep. Right here. Now, um, 
and then how do we, how, you're going to take it around to... I, I, I have another one of these letters that's just written like as a person that's in Microsoft Word. I might email that to everyone. Okay. Uh, and then I'll need a, those uh, either given back to me or emailed back to me. Because my plan is I'm not overwhelm them. I want to overwhelm them this go around like with 300 support letters. Mm -hmm. And hopefully this time it will make, I mean it almost made it last time. We were two points away from getting funded. So uh, that was a little ridiculous. Well, in the messed up part the last time, we didn't get any project and City of Seattle got four. Wow. They have, they have Amazon. Amazon could go pay for it. So, uh, and, the, and the messed up part is the last time, originally I thought we did get the grant because there was a Lions Park that was listed as being funded as number one. And our consultant was like, oh, yay, we got it. And then I'm reading it, and it turned out the Lions Park for City of Olympia got funded. You know? mm -hmm. so, uh, so, which again goes back to my previous point. They have a lot of money over there, so they should pay for it. So, <laughs> Mike, if I could, I'll speak for Rotary yeah. <laughs> as a board member. Um, we'd love to be involved at some point. Okay. Um, sometimes uh, cash donations can be limited, limited, excuse me. But we have a lot of other resources, such as uh, other Rotary funds that we can get from the Rotary Foundation and such. But it's it's less of a cash and it's more of a more involved. Yeah. So maybe there's a specific component that we could get behind to do it. Yep. We just did the Wildwood one for the city of uh, Walla Walla a couple years ago. But there's another one we're discussing with them as well. And it fits in great with, with who we are and we'd like to help any way we can. Great. Awesome. So. Well, yeah, I'm thinking the playground equipment would be a yeah. great one. A possibility, yeah. yeah. There's lots of different things. The other, the other thing that we were able to do with Wildwood was uh, since it was a rotary project, there was contractors and such and others that were able to help it, which eliminated a lot of prevailing weight pressure and some other things. So, well, and, and, and that's what, and that's where we need the most help with. So the the messed up part, pretty much with the city touching anything now. Well, with the grant, there would have been an issue anyway, but. Uh, because it's grant funded, it's a prevailing wage, which automatically pumps up the cost of everything about 30%. Yeah. Uh, the part that really compounds it for us is that up until last year, uh, if we were doing a project and if it wasn't grant funded, if it was funded with our own money, we didn't have to pay prevailing wage as long as it was funded just with city money. But there was a bill that went through the House and Senate and uh, Governor Inslee signed it last year where it basically said all forms of government, even if it's with their own money, must pay prevailing wage. Mm -hmm. So it like bloated the cost of pretty much anything we touch by about 30 to 35 percent right off the bat. Mm -hmm. Can you get a benefit through a, a, a nonprofit though, possibly in certain areas? Yeah. So what, what, what exa exactly, and that's how that's how we've had to juggle things. So, yeah. so like for instance, with the youth recreation program, here's a prime case in point. So, I know if we did our own cost town money, so I put out an RFP for a nonprofit, and uh, someone does that to take it over, and I also extended the opportunity to City of Walla Walla. So. Uh, here's, and this is interesting food for thought here, so uh, United Way and Campfire turned in a proposal to run a summer camp and have uh, competitive youth rock activities here and there'd still be a charge for it. What wall wall there's going to be a charge for it too. Uh, but the cost for the Campfire United Way one was 10000 for the year. City of Walla Walla turned in a proposal which structurally was going to cause issues because we would have to figure out a way to get our kids to Walla Walla. They weren't willing to have it in college place. And uh, a pretty similar proposal was going to cost 93000 Wow. Oh, holy cow. No, it, it was $93,000 for versus tents. So you can take a guess which way we won on that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but but that's just to illustrate that things have moved to the point 
where with a lot of these projects, you you really almost have to find like a nonprofit or someone to almost act as like a shield almost right. to get around the whole prevailing wage thing. Uh, it, it's it's also a functional way that we work as well yeah. though because we got contractors in the group and other people that are willing to, to come together under that umbrella, you know, so. Yeah. Plus other fundings and such, so. Yep. But yeah, th this year's going to be the heavy lifting from a fiduciary standpoint uh, because by the basically this time next year, we want to be into uh, doing the loving of the bids and uh, everything else so we could get going on this because that park is like the one that really needs it right now, especially since we have all of our public events there. I mean, farmers markets there, movies at the park, so. Yeah, and right now, I mean, there's parts of the park where it looks a little, we try our best, but it's a little embarrassing at times, so. <laughs> the core of it, it's a beautiful area. Yeah. I mean, it's a, the trees and everything and maturity and it looks beautiful. Yeah, yeah, it just needs to be updated, so, yep. Well, great, thank you.